I think we can say that the primary political fact that impacts the life of the Venerable Land Terry is the French Revolution and its aftermath in the unfolding of the empire under Napoleon and until his defeat in 1814. Now the French Revolution takes place when Lanteri is 30 years old, seven years a priest, and very much engaged in the fullness of his active priestly ministry. As we mentioned earlier, the little kingdom of Piedmont abuts right up against the much larger nation of France, and France was the real power in the years of Venerable Lanteri's life. So that what happens in this immensely larger and powerful nation has immediate incidence upon the life of the Kingdom of Piedmont and therefore the Ministry of Venerable Lanteri. Now, the French Revolution ushers in the, mod in the modern age. It is the tipping point between the aristocracy and the monarchy and into the age of democracy. However, and sadly, it very rapidly in its first months took a character of extreme anti-Catholicism so that very quickly the Catholic Church was persecuted and a vigorous attempt is made to entirely suppress the Catholic Church and indeed all of Christianity throughout the Republic of France and the various nations that would be conquered by the French armies. And so you have the, um, the closing of churches, the confiscation of church property, you have the forbidding of the sacraments, you have priests and nuns imprisoned, put to death, guillotined, um, deported. It, it's a time of extreme persecution and danger for the Catholic Church. And the other nations of Europe are watching this happen. And here across the, the border is the small kingdom of Piedmont watching all of this happen and aware that if France should spill over militarily into their nation, they could not possibly defend against a nation so much more powerful. And so the members of the church live in a, with a very real awareness that anything might happen, including martyrdom. And in fact, a number are martyrs in the course of the persecution unleashed by the French Revolution. So the, the young Len Terry watches all of this happen, and this is the backdrop to the exercise of his priesthood. That these, are, these are dramatic years. And the French Revolution does, just a few years later, uh, militarily attack the Kingdom of Piedmont, and eventually under the young general, just beginning to be known, Napoleon Bonaparte, quickly defeats the small nation of Piedmont, which begins a period of almost 20 years of occupation by the French. Very quickly after the French take over the nation of Piedmont, the religious orders are suppressed, they are simply sent into the streets to survive as best they can. Seminaries are closed. Seminarians are forced to enter Napoleon's armies. And a very heavy control is placed over the entirety of the teaching and life of the church. Now, the pontiff at this point, Pius VII, remains forever grateful to Napoleon because Napoleon, when he does take over power in France, signs a concordat with the Holy Father allowing the resumption of church life in France under very heavily controlled circumstances, but the Catholic Church is allowed to resume its life. So that during the years of French occupation in Piedmont, Catholic life continues, but censored, controlled, with the ever watchful eyes of Napoleon's police um, watching everything. In fact, Venerable Anteri himself quickly comes under suspicion as suspected, and quite accurately, of being overly supportive of the Holy Father in the struggles that now begin to develop between the Holy Father and Napoleon. And so he is placed under police surveillance. This will eventually lead to more dramatic measures in his regard. But these are the circumstances in which decades of his priesthood are lived. After the signing of the Concordat between Napoleon and Pius VII, Tensions rapidly begin to increase between the pontiff and the emperor, and essentially because the emperor Napoleon increasingly pressures Pius VII to fall into line with his imperial aspirations. That is, that his enemies, Napoleon's enemies, notably England, 
should also be the enemies of the Holy Father. The Holy Father resists this because he, as he tells Napoleon, he is the father of all the members of the church throughout the world. He can have no enemies in this way. Napoleon there now begins to send his armies into the Papal States and gradually absorbs them. And finally the point comes when he sends his troops into the city of Rome itself, takes over control of the city of Rome from the Holy Father, and trains his cannons on the Papal residence. But the, the breaking point comes when Napoleon simply decrees the suppression of the Papal States and their incorporation into his empire, and so the destitution of the temporal authority of the Holy Father. And at this point, the Holy Father signs the decree of excommunication of all who are, have taken part in what he sees as a sacrilege um, affecting the life of the church. And at this point, Napoleon says enough that his subordinates understand that he wants this to cease. And during the night in July of this year, three parties of French troops attack the papal palace and with axes they break down the doors and the windows, storm the palace and enter the papal apartments and take him prisoner. After a journey of a number of days, he is eventually brought to the Italian city of Savona, which is along the coast north of Genoa. And the Episcopal residence is vacated and the Holy Father is placed in that residence uh, supposedly as a guest of Napoleon. And it's in these circumstances now that dedicated Catholics come to the aid of the Holy Father, who has, uh, to mention nothing else, he has no financial means even to leave. And with some courage, he refuses the financial means that Napoleon would give him. He wants no appearance to be given to anyone that he at all is accepting what Napoleon is doing. Knowing of the destitution of the Holy Father, a number of dedicated Catholics, all of this has to be done in, in, in a clandestine way because there is even a death penalty behind this kind of support of the Holy Father. A network is formed which passes through the city of Turin on its way through France and then down through the city of Turin on its way to Savona on the coast to bring support to the Holy Father. And in this network in Turin, Venerable Antari is really the key figure. And so they channel financial resources to the Holy Father so that he's independent of Napoleon. But they also feed him news of what's going on in the church. And at key points, the documents that he needs so that he can write his response and directives to the church. All of this, of course, makes Napoleon furious. And the French police do everything they can to catch those who are involved in this kind of support of the Holy Father. Now, the key point arrives when, as years are passing, and as bishops are dying or becoming too elderly to re retain their role as bishops in various dioceses throughout the empire, which at this point covers a good deal of Western Europe, vacancies are arising, including Paris itself, which has now been without an archbishop for several years. And the Holy Father, in resistance to Napoleon, does the one thing that he can do, the only thing left to him, is his refusal to give what was called canonical institutions to the, to the priests that Napoleon would nominate as bishops for these various dioceses. And because the Holy Father is refusing the canonical institution, they are unable to function as bishops. And this is spreading now throughout the diocese of the empire, so that this becomes something of a crisis in the life of the church. Napoleon does everything he can to browbeat the Pope, sending envoys to him, making his life condition, living conditions increasingly harsh, to break down the resistance of this elderly pontiff who remarkably refuses to cede, to give way. At one point, one of Napoleon's supporters suggests a way out of the impasse to without going into all the canonical details, it, it is possible in canon law in situations of emergency when a bishop can't be anointed to appoint someone who will have the authority at least temporarily to administer the diocese. And Napoleon proposes to use this tactic now. And so it becomes urgent that the Holy Father learn about what's going on and respond. And Venerable Anteri is a key figure in identifying the church documents from canon law that the Pope needs 
and finding a man who is willing to take the risk at running the, 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 uh, the risk of losing his life, to take these documents down to the Holy Father. And the account that we have shows us this man as he kneels before the Holy Father to, uh, in sign of reverence, uh, before him in this, as the Holy Father sits in his chair with the French police watching everything that's going on, slips the documents into the fold of the Holy Father's garments, who then learns what's going on, has the canonical resources that he needs, and writes a response forbidding this tactic. At this point, Napoleon, uh, Napoleon's anger goes beyond all bounds, and everything is done now to uncover those who, who do this. And in fact, one of them is arrested, and on, amongst his papers is found a list of names. One of those names is Venerable Antares, which leads to his own arrest, to his own interrogation, the thorough search of his papers, and finally to the order given to the Archbishop of Turin to remove his priestly faculty so that he can't say Mass in public and hear confessions, and to send him in exile away from Turin. Because his health is so frail, they commute the exile to his country home, maybe about 20 kilometers outside the uh, city of Turin, where he has a country home which he used as a place to spend some time in the summer, which was also a place where he would give retreats to people. And he is exiled there now, isolated from all of his activities. And at this point, a whole new phase will come into his life. <laughs>